Hello, my name is Hokon and welcome back to my channel where today I again have a little look at the Empress Effects Zoya, the modular patchable digital synthesizer and effects module in a little box where the only limitation is your imagination and the CPU, of course. Uh, a few days ago, I posted a tutorial on showing one possible way of creating a probability sequencer on the Zoya. A probability sequencer that is a sequencer where for each step there's a certain probability that the step triggers. Um, and that, of course, is uh, done with two things really. Uh, one is a value for the probability. And the second is a random number that's generated for every step that is compared to that value. And when I made that tutorial, I promised that in my next video, possibly, I would demonstrate how uh, to do this. But instead of having one common probability value for the whole sequencer, I would create a probability value per step. And that's what this tutorial is about. But before I say anything about that, uh, a few little things I need to say as well. Um, somebody commented on Facebook and pointed out that the way I did it in my previous tutorial wasn't the best way to do it because the random LFO apparently has a center bias. So it doesn't just output evenly spread out numbers. Apparently it is more centered around well, 0.5, I suppose, uh, a certain sort of bell curve to the numbers. I didn't see any indication of that being the case uh, when I made the patch and when I demonstrated the patch, it certainly seemed to me as if the uh, probabilities matched rather well with the expectations. So if it has a center bias, it's not a very strong one, but um, I haven't analyzed the numbers enough to have a look and see if that's indeed the case. Uh, but the ones who have looked into it before, they certainly seem to think that uh, there was a center bias to the random LFO. And uh, the, the module that I should have been using, uh, which I didn't even think about because I actually haven't used it before, is the random module. Yes, it sounds quite obvious when you notice it, uh, I had used random LFOs before, and that's why I thought about those first. Uh, but there is a module called random that uh, gives out a value from 0 to 1 every time it gets a trigger input. So that's what I will be using in this patch, and then we can compare and see how that works. It's also easier because it doesn't require an extra step to convert the value into the right range. Right, another thing I want to point out, of course, in the same context, is that when I make these videos, these tutorials, generally, I don't claim that it's the only way, the best way, the most optimized way, or even the most completely accurate way of doing what I'm trying to do. What I'm demonstrating is one possible way of doing something on the Zoya, um, where the endpoint isn't necessarily the most important thing either. And by that I mean that when I make tutorials on the Zoya, I am expecting this to be viewed by people who don't own one as well. Um, which means that many of my viewers, they don't know how a Zoya works. They might wonder how a Zoya works, they might wonder what you can do with one, uh, that's part of the demographic. Another part of my demographic would be people who own a Zoya, but they still don't know how to program it. Uh, and they're trying to wrap their heads around it because this is quite tricky if you're not used to modular synthesizers, if you're not used to uh, working with algorithms of any sort, um, then using a Zoya can be quite intimidating and quite confusing. Um, and I have seen people on the Zoya forum on Facebook who are selling their Zoyas because they feel they're not using it to its full extent. And that is a bit, bit of a shame because the thing about the Zoya is it is a do-it-all kind of box. And But you don't have to use it for everything. I was using this for nine months. I was only using it as a delay and a reverb. And it is really good at it. 
it is a very good reverb and delay pedal and I was happy I didn't need to do anything else um, but then I started sort of thinking how can I create a sequencer on the Zoya and then it sort of carried on from there and I sort of got into programming it so there's no wrong and there's no right in how to use the Zoya and you don't have to use it for everything just use it for whatever you need it to do. That, that's the whole point of it. It is a blank canvas and you can create your own painting. Um, so in my tutorials, uh, as I said, the end point may not be the main idea. Uh, a lot of the time, uh, my, my philosophy for my tutorials is I want to demystify uh, the Zoya. I want to make it more accessible to people who don't know how it works. And so I very often ha end up explaining quite basic stuff in my patches, uh, which may seem a little bit redundant to someone watching this who already know how to do most things on Desire and they just want me to cut to the chase and show exactly what the workings are of that patch that do the thing that I'm advertising, uh, so to speak, that it will do. So. Um, if you are at that level of, if you are that that level Zoyan, um, you either you would have to to skip part of my uh, tutorial and hope that you find the salient bits, um, or you can actually, you probably very often would be able to just have a little look at uh, the patch uh, on patch storage. I will always now, from now on, certainly, uh, put my patches on patch storage. Uh, for my tutorials just as a companion patch so you can analyze it and if you are really good at using the Zoya already you don't need to hear me talk about how a comparator works for five minutes um, what you want to do is you want to go to patch storage get the patch and have a look at it and in two minutes you'll know exactly how it works now I think that's, that's basically all I wanted to say about that and I can get on with the patch now so I do apologize that I've taken quite a bit of your precious time talking about that but uh, to me it is important that to make the Zoya more accessible to inspire people to use it um, and of course by showing things in detail um, sometimes you may pick on, up on something new you didn't know even if you already know a bit about the Zoya and you get new ideas and inspiration from that so you may look at this tutorial and you may go and you may patch something completely differently because completely different because you just got the idea for it while watching it. And that's how I work as a creative is I get inspiration from seeing creative people work. Too much talk, let's do some patching. Right, so today I've also got my MIDI fighter twister out. I have not uh, put it in short because it doesn't really need to be. Um, and then I'm going to show you this. First, I'll just play you uh, what this sounds like. So I'm just going to... So I've got a five-step sequencer. I'm just going to do the probabilities down to zero apart from one step now. So one step now is the first step. That's 100% probable. Second step too. Third, fourth, and fifth. All steps are now 100%. Let's put them down to 50. Uh, maybe 20 ish, it's hard to tell for sure. Uh, and that's how it works. And actually, when I was doing that demonstration, it seems that even though this has a better spread maybe than the other way of doing it, it certainly I actually seemed like it's less correct <laughs> uh, relative to, I was at about 20% now for all the steps and it went through three cycles without triggering a single one. Anyway, um, 
I'm going to show this with the random module anyway. It doesn't matter which works best. I think I actually prefer the results of the uh, random LFO because it seemed to trigger more consistently with my expectations. Um, but um, I'll analyze that some other time. Um, right, so how does this patch work? So first, as I usual, I'm going to just go quickly through the synth voice here. So I've got a triangle oscillator here. Uh, that's going into a VCA. The VCA is triggered by, or the uh, amplitude of the VCA, the level control of the VCA, I should say, is controlled by an ADSR envelope. Uh, and the output of the VCA is going into a delay. And the output of the delay is going into a reverb, plate reverb. I quite like the plate reverb for synth sounds. Um, and uh, the output of the plate reverb is going into the audio output. And then there are two sequences running here. And of course, they didn't have to be two sequences. I could have used two tracks on the same sequence. But um, if you want to control the values of a sequence from somewhere else, you can only control track number one. When you patch a module into a pad of a step on the step sequence, so you only control track number one. So if you want to control two tracks of sequencer, you have to make two separate sequences. So I've got one track, one sequencer now that is the melody sequencer, uh, and I'll map that to my MIDI fighter twister to control the um, control the note values. And I've got a second sequencer down here, which as you can see is moving in parallel now. And they're both five steps, by the way, and that's just to do with the space on, uh, on this page now. Uh, and that is the one that has the probability values for the step being triggered. And again, those are mapped to my MIDI fighter twister MIDI controller. And then uh, I have also got on my MIDI fighter twister a control of an LFO. Um, and that is probably actually needlessly, I should say, going via a value module now because I was probably, yeah, it doesn't have to. Um, I'm going via a value module because originally in this patch design, I had two LFOs, of course. I had the random LFO and I had the one for the tempo. Uh, now that I've removed the one for the uh, random LFO, uh, I could actually just remove the uh, value module there. So I'll just remove that right away and I'll set that control to the uh, same one there. Okay, so now we have, okay, so now we have a direct um, direct control of our LFO with our MIDI controller. Now, if you want to, um, if you have a Zoya patch you want to control without a MIDI controller, um, it does often actually make sense to have a value modules uh, that control things happening because it's easy to keep track of what's going on. So you have a separate performance page where you set up value modules that do the different, have the different controls you want and you remember where they are and you go in and you control those. Um, and of course, if you have a MIDI controller, you have your MIDI inputs um, and I've got them on a separate page here and patch those up to wherever they need to be. So, uh, so I've got an LFO here for the tempo and I've got a random module down here. So those are, uh, so the random, uh, no, sorry, let's do the LFO first. So the LFO is the one that advances the sequences. So they are, it's connected to the both of the sequences gate inputs. Now, uh, another thing that I like doing when I'm working with sequences is to make sure that when I change a note value on uh, either in the value module on the Zoya or on the MIDI controller, I don't want the output of the sequencer to change if I happen to be changing the same step that it's playing. 
And one way to accomplish this that is very easy, and I often do this, is to use a sample and hold. So I've also got here the output of the sequencer, of both sequencers. So both the note sequencer and the probability sequencer, they go into uh, a sample and hold, each their own sample and hold here. Um, that is triggered by this CV delay. And the reason this is through a delay is because if I patch the LFO now straight into gate and into the sample and hold, it is going to sample the input before the note value has been updated. It's trying to sample it at the same time as the note value is being or the step is moving forward so if i didn't put a delay here when i'm on at the start of step one of the sequencer it would be sampling the value from the previous step from the last step of the sequence um, which means that it still works it's just that you'll be one step behind all the time so I put in a delay of one click, 1.33 milliseconds, which is the smallest unit of time on the Zoya. Uh, and that is enough for it to wait until the step has moved along and the note value of the sequences or the CV value, I should say, has been updated. So those go into the sample and hold. The way the sample and hold works, I'm going to explain this every time, is it has an input that very often uh, when you use sample and hold, you want that to be a dynamic value, something that can change, because that's often when you need one. And when and only when it gets a trigger input, it will copy the value of the input to the output. So that means that this value may change all the time. It might be just all over the place but it's only when it gets a trigger that the value is copied over to the output. And that allows us to change a note value, for instance, or a probability value for a step. Uh, but while the sequencer is on that step, the output of the sequencer doesn't change because it hasn't got a new trigger input because it only gets a new trigger input every time the step sequencer advances forward uh, because that's the same time that the sample and hold gets its trigger input. Uh, although the sample and hold gets it 1.33 milliseconds later to make sure that it is sampling the correct step. So that gives us a nice clean value out. So uh, I'll just do the note values first. So the note value here. Um, is then going to, and there wasn't any room on the previous page or the page before, it goes into a quantizer. I uh, didn't need a quantizer, but uh, I do like when I'm playing with sequences to have some kind of quantization. Uh, a quantizer takes a CV value, it doesn't have to be inherently a note value, but what it does is it moves it to the nearest note value in the specified key and scale. So, and this one is set now to A major, but also I made a control now so I can change it to minor natural. Um, and also I can change the key with a knob on the MIDI fighter twister as well. Um, and it takes an input and changes it to the nearest note in that key and scale and outputs that note value. And that is the note value that is then input into the oscillator frequency input. So it will always now play a note that is in key. Um, so that's what happens to the note value. The most interesting thing, of course, is not what happens to the note value, but what happens to the probability value. Uh, so we have here, in parallel with the five-step note sequencer, a five-step 
sequence. Well, that could have been notes, but instead it's CV values that now are intended to be probability values. Now, of course, uh, it's worth pointing out at this point that there's absolutely no technical reason why these two sequences have to be the same length. Now, the Zoya is good for thinking outside the box. And even though you think, oh, I want one step, one probability rating per step of this sequencer, maybe it is more interesting sometimes to have a different length of sequences so that which step gets a probability, certain probability will change as the sequencer moves along. Just a thought. But for the purposes of this tutorial, I have made them the same length so that each step here corresponds to a step on the main note sequencer. So the output of this sequencer goes to a sample and hold as well. Uh, and from there on, it actually goes into a CV inverter. So it takes the value and it inputs into an inverter, which makes it negative. So it creates, if it gets an input of zero point is about 10% now, 10 to 15, it creates a value of minus the same thing. Uh, and the reason it does that is because I want to use that for a negative value in a comparator, and I'll get back to that in a moment. I just want to show you one other thing here now. Um, if you want two sequences to be in sync, or to resynchronize them at some point, if they go out of sync for some reason, um, it could be that you have sequences running at different tempos when you are adjusting things. It could be that you are patching on the fly and then you want to synchronize sequences after you've made them. Um, these sequences have a Q start pad uh, and that is a, an extra option in your sequencer edit here. Restart jack is by default off, but if you set it to on, you get a restart pad. Uh, and then you can have a button. There's a push button that goes into the restart pads of both sequences. And every time I push this, it will start over again. And that means I can synchronize them up if I want to. Not a necessary thing, but it's a very useful little thing to have available. I think I also mapped that to, yeah, I mapped it to one of my buttons on my MIDI fighter twister as well. Right. Um, so, um, the output of the probability goes into an inverter and goes into the negative input of a comparator. Now, the way a comparator works is that it has two inputs known as the positive and the negative input. And as long as or when the positive input is equal to or higher than the negative input, the comparator will output a value of one. Now, every now and again, you can see it will flash up with one. Um, and the way I want to run the probability now is I want to put the random number into the positive input. So that's the one that is randomly generated by the random module down here. So it gets triggered by the LFO. Every time the LFO triggers, it creates a new random number. That random number is sent to the positive input of the comparator and compared against the negative input, which is uh, the inverted value of the probability plus one. This module, I've added an offset. I've set the value in the module itself to be one. So it's moved all the way to the right. You can see this little round dot there is set to value one. And that means that it, so if you have set it to 10% probability, that is 0 0.1, uh, and that outputs here from this, and you get, and that turns into a negative number, you get 1 minus 0 0.1, that is 0 0.9. And that means that the comparator only triggers if the positive value, the value from the random generator, is higher than 0 
and it is only higher than 0 0.9 in 10% of 10% of the time, uh, theoretically. So if you want this to happen 10% of the time, you have a value here of 0 0.1, which becomes a minus 0 0.1, and then 1 minus 0 0.1 is 0 0.9, and that will give us a, an output of 1 from the comparator 10% of the time. Uh, and the output from the comparator goes to a multiplier down here. So, um, and the multiplier, it takes the value from the comparator, which now has decided that the conditions for this step to play have been met. That's what the comparator output means uh, as an algorithm. Um, but it still needs to create a gate signal for the ADSR to trigger. And it does that by multiplying the output of the comparator with, technically, with the LFO that is moving things forward. Uh, but um, it is going via, so the output from the LFO here, the master LFO, goes to a delay module again uh, before it goes into the multiplier. And that's because some of these calculations here now, they take time. So um, uh, the comparator takes a little bit of time to work. And so, and of course, you'll remember, we also had a little bit of time before the sample and hold gets triggered 1.33 milliseconds after the LFO. And then it has to go into an inverter, and then it has to go into a comparator, and then the comparator will trigger. So all that adds up, and it has now got up to a delay time of 5.33 milliseconds before it multiplies with the comparator um, to create a gate signal. If the delay here is too short, um, you actually get a double trigger because of the way the, you can get a double trigger where you get a uh, first a long gate and then a short tiny gate at the end of it. So, but now it works fine and you have the output from the multiplier is then the gate that goes into the ADSR envelope. And the ADSR envelope, of course, are attack, decay, sustain, release, classic synthesizer envelope. Um, and then that goes to the output which is patched into the VCA level for the oscillator, which controls the volume of the sound before it goes into the effects. And that pretty much is the patch. Um, so nothing, nothing very complicated, really. Um, it's quite a quite a simple, simple little thing. But as with many things on the Zoya, even simple things can will seem complicated if you don't know how they work. And, and of course, as I did point out earlier, um, any sort of thing that you do with this patch is something that might inspire another patch or give you an idea for how to do something, or you may it may have just spurred an idea um, of something you want to do. Uh, because the thing about the Zoya is the way I make patches is I just think to myself, what do I need the Zoya to do? Or uh, I see an effects pedal uh, and I think, oh, how can I replicate that on the Zoya? Or um, I just come up with an idea someday and I think, is it possible for the Zoya to do this? And then I start figuring out how that would work on the Zoya. And then I patch it up and then I make a tutorial usually as well. So relatively simple little thing, uh, a little bit simpler than the previous one because of the random module rather than the random LFO. Um, so um, let's just play you out, shall we? So if you, if you enjoyed this, uh, please like, share, comment, subscribe. Join me on Patreon if you like what I do on this channel and you want to support me um, and you want to see more of it. And uh, thank you very much for watching and goodbye for now. I will just play you out into the sunset.